Hi everyone, today we'll talk about firearms of the Wild West. Yeah, a cowboy and his trusty Colt 45. Although Colt 45, that's kind of boring. Yeah, right. How about a cowboy with his lead spewing pepper box? Add to that a killing harmonica, a revolver shotgun combo, and a pull string revolver. Them old gunsmiths were truly inventive, weren't they? So let us tell you about the most curious and remarkable guns of the Wild West. Allen and Thurber Pepper Box. This bizarre weapon looks something like a pocket machine gun and like a real pepper box as well. The strange appearance aside, these guns were quite popular in the frontier lands. First, they were simple and reliable. Second, they packed enough firepower at close range. And that's exactly what people needed for self-defense. Third, they were affordable, four times cheaper than a Colt. So unless you were a pro gunslinger, you were likely to opt for one of these. Besides, Allen and Thurber offered a wide choice of models ranging from 22 to 36 in caliber and from 2 to 6 inches in barrel length. They could have 4 barrels or 5 or 6. Whatever you say as long as you pay. And they come engraved too. Yes sir, many of these budget handguns look quite fine with the frame ornaments and imitation silver inlays. Very pretty. The main drawback of pepper boxes was that they were muzzle loaders. Loading was cumbersome and it took a long time. But once you get one loaded, pepper boxes had a double action trigger, which was an advanced feature at the time. The Army Colt, for example, had a single action trigger, so the shooter had to cock it manually. Remington Model 95 Remember that movie scene when the supposedly unarmed Django all of a sudden produces a cute little double barrel? It was a Model 95 double derringer, a truly remarkable pistol. It was tiny, less than 5 inches long and weighing 11 ounces, but this little thing was loaded with 41 caliber cartridges and it spewed the lead at 685 feet per second. Given that the 1873 Army Colt has a muzzle velocity of just 650 feet per second, this wasn't half bad for an 11 ounce piece. This handgun could fire twice before reloading, once from each barrel. Reloading involved opening the barrel lock, swiveling the barrels upwards placing the cartridges inside and putting the barrels back down. All these steps for a total of two shots. So you could say this Derringer was a two-shot single try weapon. Either you hit the target on your first attempt or you were in trouble. Curiously, the pistol had no trigger guard. When not in use, the trigger was stowed away within the frame fins and could be brought to readiness by cocking the gun. The double Derringer was intended for concealed carry and was so popular among gamblers, women, traders, travelers, and generally anyone who wished to protect themselves against a sudden attack. This piece could fit easily inside a woman's purse or be hidden in the clothes. Overall, Remington sold more than 150,000 of these handy affordable sidearms. Two Barrel 20 Round Pinfire Revolver In an effort to create a high capacity handgun, 19th century gunsmiths tried different approaches some of which were quite bizarre. The French inventor Le Fao came up with a model that involved two barrels and a huge cylinder housing 20 pinfire cartridges. This type of cartridge was also his invention. The revolver was first patented in France but eventually reached the US. It quickly gained popularity, especially in the American South, and for a good reason at that. The main advantage was obvious, 20 shots against the adversaries, 5 or 6, with the double action firing mechanism. The shooter also had an advantage in speed, firing alternatively from two barrels without needing to cock the hammer. The 7mm caliber was rather small, but that's understandable. The massive cylinder could not be made larger without reducing overall efficiency. Even the way it was, the revolver felt heavy and difficult to handle. The inventor tried to alleviate this by getting rid of the trigger guard. Instead, the owner could fold the trigger and tuck it up into the frame. A questionable solution, true. The revolver became somewhat lighter, but the foldable trigger makes firing less convenient. Lamat Revolver Jean-Alexandre Lamat was a physician by trade. Ironically, he invented a revolver shotgun combo with considerable stopping power. Could be the guy got fed up with all those pesky patients. In any case, the piece he created turned out to be powerful, efficient, and innovative. Its main feature was a smoothbore 20 gauge second barrel that fired buckshot, and since revolvers were mostly used at close range, the result was devastating. The other barrel was a conventional rifle board 6.5 inches long and firing 42 caliber cartridges, which for the 19th century was pretty modest, but the cylinder could house as many as 9 rounds. Not bad at all. 
The shooter could switch between the barrels simply by shifting a lever on the hammer. However, this revolver had quite a few flaws, and serious ones at that. First, the rammer's lever was rather flimsy. Second, the smoothbore ramrod would often fall off and get lost. Third, the indexing mechanism was prone to wear. For these reasons, the Lamotte never gained wide popularity. It was deadly and versatile all right, but unreliable and expensive. Colt Revolver Rifle Meet a revolver that was also a rifle. Although after the revolver shotgun combo, it doesn't sound all that weird. This revolving percussion rifle was an attempt to make a multi-shot long gun, and it wasn't particularly successful. But there was no good alternative, so no one complained. Essentially, this rifle was the same M1860 revolver, but with a stock and a very long barrel. Although there was one difference, the rifle was self-cocking. In some models, the inventors went for a 7 or 8 chamber cylinder, since the weapon's overall dimensions allowed for these kind of experiments. But mostly it was the same old 6, 36 caliber or 44 caliber rounds. The revolving rifle offered relatively low accuracy, but made up for it in the rate of fire. The ammo was easy to come by, the gun required no special rifle cartridges, and could fire the standard revolver rounds. But despite these many advantages, the weapon didn't fly. It was truly difficult to handle. A long gun isn't a revolver, it must be held with two hands. One hand would grip this rifle right in front of the cylinder, and firing gas is remarkably hot. Getting fingers burned after each shot isn't anyone's idea of fun. Noel Caplock Revolver There is power in names. Pierre Noel named his invention a rotovolver, and the weapon turned out to reflect the name, complicated and cumbersome. Basically, it was a caplock revolver, with a cylinder axis running horizontally at the right angle to the barrel. Why was it this way? Who knows? This handgun was hard to carry because of the bulging cylinder would catch on things. The loading process was a whole project onto itself. First, you need to remove the cylinder. So what, you ask? Take it out, load it up, put it back in. Not so fast. The weapon design simply wouldn't let you do it quickly. Placing the loaded cylinder back into the frame required quite some time, and who would need that? Power-wise, Noel's handgun wasn't too impressive either. The 0.289 caliber coming out a 3.5-inch long barrel is quite modest. Although the foldable trigger was guarded from accidental pushes by means of a safety tab on the right side of the frame, the cylinder chambers were located radially, so one round was always directed squarely at the shooter's face. Who would appreciate that? Gunslingers of the Old West didn't. Noel was able to sell a few hundred rotovolvers. After that, the production collapsed. Even multi-shot 10-cap cylinders couldn't save it. Cochrane Turret Revolver John Cochrane was another gunsmith who approached things from an unusual angle. He invented a revolver with a cylinder rotating around a vertical pivot. It looked like a close relative of Noel's rotovolver and had the same problems. The cylinder had to be removed for reloading. The gun couldn't fit inside a flat holster and two rounds looked straight at the shooter at all times. But in terms of inconvenience, Cochrane did reach a new height. The shooter had to manually rotate the cylinder after each shot, so you cock the gun, you fire, and then you turn the drum and cock the gun again. Now that was innovative. Naturally, no one would buy a marvel like that except for collectors. Cochrane sold 150 pieces of this model in total. He didn't abandon the concept though, and came up first with a drum rifle and later a field gun. He even managed to sell the patent to Turkish gunsmiths, making good money. Granted, the artillery design never made it to production, but that was the Turk's problem. Jonathan Browning's Harmonica Here's another example of a multi-shot long barrel weapon. And once again, an ill-fated one. God damn it, Albert, no more friends. Browning's horizontal harmonica magazine held five 54 caliber cartridges. Firing wasn't automatic, of course. The shooter needed to slide the magazine by hand, making sure to place the next cartridge precisely under the hammer and in alignment with the barrel. Don't forget that in the process of shooting the magazine got really hot. This caused another problem. The charges in the neighboring chambers could catch fire, and in the best scenario, the shooter would lose the entire load. In the worst case, he would end up with a few extra holes in his body. To prevent chain firing, gun owners smeared the chambers with a wax and tallow mix. By the way, the maker of this weapon, Jonathan Browning, was the father of the legendary gunsmith John Moses Browning. Looks like gun making was a thing in that family. Jonathan was a faithful Mormon. He had three wives and 22 children. 
He inscribes the words holiness to the land, our preservation on all his weapons. Yes, the first word was holiness, on a 54 caliber 5 shooter. Bank Teller's Mounted Revolver Bet you haven't seen this one before. This 20 shot contraption that doesn't look like anything else is still in fact a revolver. It just has no handle, basically has no frame either. What it does have is grooves for mounting to a wall or to a counter, and a trigger ending with an eyelet for a piece of rope or wire. Here is how this astonishing device was used. It was mounted at a strategic spot on the wall, under a desk, etc. The important thing was that the barrel would point at the person entering the room. Often two of these weapons were used to cover a wider area. If the esteemed patron turned out to be a transgressing robber, the bank teller would open fire. One way was to install a pedal under the desk. This was convenient, discreet, and effective. The teller would hold up his hands, smile politely at the intruders, and step on the pedal, shooting the poor souls on the spot. Another way involves ropes. Bank tellers' desks and counters were often protected with bulletproof plates. At the first sign of danger, the teller would duck under the desk and pull the ends of the ropes. Of course, the opposite ends were tied to the triggers. They say banks often became robbery targets in the Old West. We were raiders, and we're going to do some raiding again. Pardon me, ma'am. <laughs> this system wasn't especially effective. Still, even poor protection is better than no protection at all. Volcanic Pistol The Volcanic Pistol is one of the first creations of the famous Smith & Wesson duo. The talented inventors were still inexperienced at the time, and the product they made proved problematic. This handgun was supposed to benefit from multiple truly brilliant concepts, but turned out to be ineffective, unpredictable, and unsafe. Volcanic's main issue had to do with the caseless round it used. It was a conical bullet with a hollow in the rear end. The hollow was filled with powder and then stoppered with a primer. Naturally, the amount of powder that could fit the hollow was small, less than 0.017 ounce for a 38 round. That simply wasn't enough for a 0.23 ounce bullet. This kind of ammo afforded no distance, accuracy, or stopping power and couldn't scare a mouse. On the other hand, they often exploded, even right at the gun store. The faintest jolt could bang them against one another, igniting the primers, and the entire shelf would go kaboom. As for the design of the pistol, it was actually good. The rounds were housed in a tubular, under-barrel magazine. Turning the lever caused the rod to cock the hammer and ready the trigger. At the same time, the mechanism lifted a new round. The return of the lever caused the hammer to load the round into the barrel chamber. The barrel chamber was shut securely with a crank and rod assembly. Sounds familiar? It should. Sometime later, the same mechanism was used in Winchester and Henry rifles. The world-famous gunmaker Oliver Winchester was part of the Volcanic Company and picked up quite a few things there. The tubular underbarrel magazine was also used later in the 1871 Remington handgun, which enjoyed some popularity as well. However, all these models used more advanced rimfire rounds instead of the hazardous rocket-like bullet. What an unfortunate beginning for Smith & Wesson. So many excellent ideas and the pistol turned out to be a failure. We hope you enjoyed the video and we want to know which one of these was your favorite. Let us know in the comments. And if you liked the video, then click the subscribe button and click the little notification bell so you'll be the first to know when a new video arrives. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.